Good morning, good afternoon, possibly even good evening, depending on what time zone you're joining us from today. I'm very excited to be giving my first ever talk at JupyterCon this year. Today's talk will be on best practices for managing Jupyter Lab based data science projects using Conda and PIP. So my name is David Pugh. I'm a staff scientist at the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology's Visualization Core Laboratory. I'm also a certified instructor with software carpentry and data carpentry. So just a quick outline for today's talk. The first half of the talk is going to focus on a system-wide Jupyter Lab installation. With a system-wide uh, installation, we'll be using Conda and PIP to manage a single Jupyter Lab install that is shared across all the data science projects on a machine. The second half of the talk is going to focus on a project-based approach to Jupyter Lab installation, where we use Conda and PIP to install Jupyter Lab individually for each project. Along the way, we're going to talk about some best practices for both of these approaches, and then I'll show some example repos on GitHub that demonstrate these best practices. And then at the end, I'll wrap up with a discussion of the relevant trade-offs. So let's go ahead and jump in. So a system-wide JupyterLab installation. Again, just to reiterate, with a system-wide installation, we use Conda and PIP to install a single JupyterLab installation, and then use that JupyterLab across all of the projects on a machine. There are a couple of advantages to this approach. Uh, the most obvious advantage is that you get consistency of user interface and user experience across all of your projects. You'll have the same version of Jupyter Lab installed for all of your projects. You'll have the same common set of extensions to Jupyter Lab available for all of your projects. So this just makes it um, a nice, common, comfortable uh, user interface and user experience for all of your projects. The second advantage is that it's a little bit quicker to get started with a new project. You don't have to install and rebuild JupyterLab. You just have to manage your new project-specific environment. And finally, uh, if you like to do more low-level advanced configuration of JupyterLab with a system-wide approach, it's a little bit easier. You just need to go into the .jupyter directory and uh, make the relevant changes to those files, um, and then they will be reflected in your system-wide JupyterLab install. So here's a typical environment.yaml file for a system-wide install. Um, now, if you're new to Conda, the environment.yaml file is basically the Conda analog of the pip requirement.txt file. So there's a few things I want to draw your attention to. Um, the first is that uh, we need to give our Conda environment file a name. So here I'll call it the JupyterLab base environment. The second is the channels. So channels is what determines where Conda looks to find packages to install. So in every Conda environment file, I include Conda Forge channel and the defaults channel. I like to give Conda Forge priority over the defaults channel, so that's why it's listed first in this file. Now, as far as dependencies go, of course, we're going to be installing JupyterLab and all of its dependencies. We can also list any um, JupyterLab extensions that are available for install via Conda here. So an example of that would be JupyterLab Git. I also want to draw your attention to Node.js. So Node.js is required for building JupyterLab as well as some extensions. It's often available um, on most operating systems already, but rather than use the operating system version of Node, it's always better to explicitly install a separate version in your environment. That way you can get a very recent version of Node that is consistent with your JupyterLab and any extensions that you're installing. So next, we're going to install pip. So it's always a best practice to install pip in every Conda environment because not everything is available via Conda channels. You may need to install things with pip. In particular, lots of interesting JupyterLab extensions are only available via pip. So we can list those actually in a requirements.txt file and then kind of pass that in uh, via the environment.yaml file using this kind of syntax that you see here. Finally, I install a version of Python and then an interesting alternative Python kernel called Zeus Python, which has some nice uh, JupyterLab integration and some nice extensions. Right, so some best practices for our system-wide JupyterLab. So this base environment should really only contain JupyterLab and any required extensions, and obviously any dependencies, but those are gonna be managed via Conda and PIP. You don't have to worry about those so much. Uh, and in particular, uh, JupyterLab environments are a little bit more complicated. There's some more moving pieces. You've got Conda installable packages. You've got pip installable packages. 
You may need to rebuild uh, JupyterLab, run some JupyterLab extension install commands. So it's best to automate this entire process with a bash script wherever possible. Um, now, you should not be installing any uh, packages that you actually use for your data science projects into this base environment. Those should all go in separate project-specific conda and pip environments. And once we have these project-specific environments, you can link them to your common JupyterLab installation by creating these custom Jupyter kernels. And we're going to see how to do that in a few slides. OK, so I talked about the importance of automating the environment build process with Bash. So here's my Bash script that I use to do this in my own work. So first, I want to draw your attention to the fact that um, this Bash script runs inside of a login shell. That's the dash dash login you see in that very first line there. So this basically sources the relevant Bash profile files such that the conda activate command will work properly when this script is run. So uh, just to walk you through the script, so like the first line in the script, uh, or the first command really in the script, is the conda environment create command. And so we're going to create an environment by name from a particular environment.yaml file. Now, you may not be familiar with this dash dash force command, or flag rather, even if you're an experienced Conda user. Uh, this dash dash force flag will cause uh, Conda to just overwrite any environment with that same name that it finds whenever the script is run. And that's kind of the behavior that we want. We just want to be able to, anytime we make changes to the environment.yaml or the requirement.txt file, we want to be able to just rerun the script and it will just rebuild everything from scratch. Then after we activate the JupyterLab environment, uh, inside the script, we're going to source this thing called post-build. This post-build file, as we'll see in a minute, is just a simple text file that contains all of our JupyterLab extension install commands to properly enable uh, certain JupyterLab extensions. And then if we need to rebuild JupyterLab, we can put the JupyterLab build command there as well. So there's a link here um, to a branch on the repo that I created on GitHub for this talk. It contains um, all the configuration files for the base JupyterLab environment that I've been talking about. We already talked about the environment.yaml file. So I'll just point here to the requirement.txt file. So the, the requirement.txt file here, I've listed um, a couple of JupyterLab extensions, the Jupyter Language Server Protocol, which brings um, some kind of full-on uh, integrated development environment features, uh, such as um, hover and uh, really nice autocomplete uh, features and uh, some really nice error messages and things like that, as well as uh, Python specific components of that language server. So those are installed via pip, so we can put them here in the requirements.txt file. Um, now let's look at this post build file. So here's what I meant by relist these JupyterLab extension install commands. So here I'm going to install the the lab extension for uh, the language server, uh, server protocol, and also a really cool debugger that works with the Zeus Python kernel that I mentioned earlier. And then notice that we pass in these dash dash no build flags to make sure that we don't build JupyterLab until we've installed all the extensions, and then we can build it once at the end. And then that um, automate script that I mentioned is actually here in the bin directory. So this is just uh, an exact copy of what you found in the slides. And then when you run this script, it just completely automates the process of creating this environment. OK, so moving on. So once we've created our um, and automated the creation of our JupyterLab environment, and we've got our project conda environments, we need to link these two together so that this common JupyterLab installation can be shared across all of our Conda data science uh, project environments. So the way that you do that is by creating custom Jupyter kernels for each Conda environment. And this is what's going to allow you to actually launch Jupyter Notebooks and IPython consoles from within JupyterLab attached to these different Conda environments for your projects. So you can actually automate this process. So there's a link here on this slide to a Jupyter Conda extension that will just detect what Conda environments are available on your machine and then build these Jupyter kernels for them. 
Um, I kind of prefer to do this process manually because I have so many conda environments on my machine and actually only a subset of them are relevant for working uh, uh, within JupyterLab. So I prefer to create these custom uh, kernels manually. So I'm going to talk about how to do that next. So here is the process for manually creating uh, a custom Jupyter kernel. Um, it's important to remember to activate the conda environment for the project for which you want to create the kernel. So otherwise, if you run the python-m ipykernel install command, you might create uh, a Jupyter kernel for the wrong environment. So be sure to activate the conda environment for your project first. The next thing is that you actually do need to install the ipykernel package inside of your project's conda environment. So if it's not already there, you can go back and add it to the environment.yaml uh, file as a dependency rebuild your project's conda environment, and then come back and run this Python command. So that will install, uh, that will create a kernel spec file, uh, which is what actually links your conda environment for your project with the JupyterLab uh, installation. Notice that there's a, a name and a display name. So the name is basically just an internal use only name. You can, if you have a name for your project, you can just put dash kernel at the end of it. Um, I guess the important thing is the display name. So whatever you put there in that string will be the name that you see in the JupyterLab launcher for notebooks and IPython consoles. And this is what you'll see. So if you create uh, a custom kernel using the command on the previous slide, and then you refresh your JupyterLab, this is what you would see. So on, on the, the left, we have just plain Python 3 notebooks and consoles that are attached to the environment in which JupyterLab is running. On the right, you have Zeus Python uh, notebooks and IPython consoles that are also attached to the conda environment in which JupyterLab is installed. And in the middle, you have uh, a launcher for notebooks and consoles attached to the project-specific environment that you would have created uh, the kernel for in the previous slide. So that's kind of what it looks like. Okay, just to kind of wrap up the system-wide uh, JupyterLab installation. So once we have these different um, kernels for each of our um, uh, project-specific conda environments, we want to uh, make sure that we can install things from within the Jupyter Notebook and from it within IPython consoles into those underlying project environments and not accidentally install packages into the JupyterLab conda environment. So the way that we do that was by using these built-in IPython magic commands, the percent conda, percent, percent pip magic commands. So these commands can be run from within either Jupyter Notebooks or within IPython consoles, and they will install packages into the conda environment uh, for which those notebooks or IPython consoles are attached via this kernel spec file that we were talking about in the previous, uh, previous slides. So they kind of work as expected. Um, I find them to be mostly useful for prototyping new projects. Um, and I prefer for anything that is kind of production or more developed research project to instead, once I figure out I have another package I want to use, I prefer to just go back and add it to the environment.yaml file um, or the requirements.txt file and then just rebuild the project's conda environment and then go back to work. Um, it's a little bit more uh, overhead, but the benefit is that you always... You're, you're always in the habit of making a record of everything that you're using um, at the time that you, you understand that you need it. Okay, so that's the system-wide approach. So now we're gonna talk about a project-based approach. The project-based approach to JupyterLab installation is you're gonna use Conda and PIP to install JupyterLab installations for each project separately. So the primary advantage to this approach is flexibility. So you get kind of uh, a bespoke, customized JupyterLab user interface and user experience for each project. You have, can have different versions of JupyterLab for every project, a whole different set of extensions for every project if you want. It's very customizable, very flexible. Uh, it allows easier experimentation with bleeding edge features of JupyterLab. So, you know, if you want to have a project that has a, the most recent version available of JupyterLab and a whole bunch of extensions that will only work with that version, you can have a project that supports that bleeding edge version of JupyterLab. You can have projects that, um, well, many extensions 
still only work with JupyterLab 1.x. So I have a lot of teaching repos that need extensions that only work with JupyterLab 1.x. So I have projects for those uh, courses where I've pinned the versions to JupyterLab 1.x. And I have newer projects for my own research, which almost always use JupyterLab 2.x and extensions that only work with JupyterLab 2.x. So that kind of workflow is a lot easier with a project-based approach. Um, it also automatically makes your project repos binder ready. Now, if you're not familiar with Binder, so Binder is a service for turning Git repos into collections of interactive notebooks. Basically, you put some configuration files in your project uh, in your project repo, and then you can basically put that GitHub URL uh, straight into this Binder interface, and it will launch those notebooks inside of an environment based on those configuration files uh, running in the public cloud. So it's a really cool service. And the neat thing is that the configuration files, environment.yaml, requirements.txt, and post build, uh, if you use these, then your project will be automatically binder ready. Okay. So here is a environment.yaml file for a project-based install. So here, I guess the interesting thing to note is that it looks really similar to the system-wide uh, environment.yaml. And it is. The only difference, or the major difference, is that we have now we're going to be installing all of the project uh, specific packages that we need, whether they're available via Conda, in which case we can just list them here as dependencies like pandas or scikit-learn. Or if they're available pip, via pip, we can put them in the requirements.txt file. Now, just like with the system-wide install, we also want to uh, automate environment creation with bash scripts wherever possible. Now, this is very similar to the bash script from the system-wide install. Um, the only difference that I would like to draw your attention to is that I like to install my project-specific Conda environments into a subdirectory, EMV, of my project's directory. And that has the nice benefit of keeping my entire software stack encapsulated within the project directory. Also, this env directory is nicely ignored by the standard python.gitignore file. So we don't have to worry about accidentally version controlling our environment directory. OK, so here's some examples of projects, uh, project-based JupyterLab installs that, that use kind of these, these best practices. I've created three here. So one based around the scikit-learn ecosystem, a second based around the PyTorch ecosystem. Uh, the PyTorch uh, example includes a JupyterLab extension for TensorBoard, uh, which is commonly used to track um, training progress and convergence uh, with PyTorch. Um, and then the third is I, uh, the one that I think is most interesting. It combines JupyterLab, NVIDIA Rapids, Blazing SQL, and Dask. And so let's take a look at that project. So in this project, we have our environment.yaml file, which contains um, the core dependencies, so Blazing SQL, a very new version of the CUDA toolkit, a very new version of JupyterLab, uh, and then, of course, pip and the, the syntax for pulling in the requirement.txt file, new version of Python, and a very new version of Rapid. So just the core dependencies. And note that we have quite a few more channels here. That's because Blazing SQL and Rapids and NVIDIA dependencies all have their, their own channels. Okay. So if we look at the requirements.txt file, here we have two extensions that we're installing. One is a Dask lab extension that provides some nice um, interactive widgets for uh, exploring the state of your Dask cluster. And the other is JupyterLab NV dashboard. So this is a dashboard that allows you to do um, kind of real-time monitoring of uh, CPU, GPU, and memory utilization and network uh, bandwidth uh, utilization for your uh, machine learning training jobs. I believe that there is actually a talk on JupyterLab NV dashboard at JupyterCon this year. And then lastly, we'll have this post-build script and again, here we've got our JupyterLab extension install commands for uh, the Dask lab extension and the JupyterLab AP dashboard, and then the JupyterLab build command. So yeah, I think you can get a sense of, of the pattern here that, that I'm uh, encouraging you to use. Now, the bin directory 
here is what contains the uh, create conda environment script. Again, it's pulled straight off the slide. And then in the readme, I've put instructions of how you can clone this branch locally and then run the environment creation script yourself to, um, to replicate this environment on your local machine. Now, you will need a, a local Linux machine, and obviously you will only get uh, you know, the GPU support if you also have a GPU uh, on your machine. Now, I've made this repo binder launchable, so you can click this button and launch this uh, on binder. Um, it will install everything, um, but you obviously don't have GPUs on Binder, so you won't be able to actually uh, run or test out any code, unfortunately. Maybe in the future. Okay, so moving right along. Okay, so just to wrap up this talk, uh, I want to cover kind of which of these is the right approach for you uh, and um, when should you use them. So. My first general uh, rule of thumb is that you should prefer the project-based approach. Um, it has much greater flexibility, and as long as you're automating the environment uh, creation and build process with the scripts that I've encouraged you to use, there's also minimal additional overhead. Um, this is the approach that I use in my own work and in my work with uh, my users and clients at Calst, and it's the one that I've found to be kind of the most, uh, uh, the most usable. It's also a good idea if you have some CPU-based data science projects and some GPU data science projects to go with a project-based approach. I think what you'll what you'll quickly find is that your JupyterLab installs are, are going to bifurcate into your CPU-only projects and your GPU-accelerated projects anyway. There's some really nice, interesting GPU-focused uh, JupyterLab extensions. You're going to want to use those on your GPU projects. So you're gonna end up with two separate installs. And then once you have two, it kind of makes sense to just go ahead and manage everything um, for each project and gain the additional flexibility of customization at the project level. Now, on the other hand, if you have a common set of extensions that you like to use and you really like to have a consistent user interface and experience, um, perhaps, you work in a lab and you want everybody to have the same uh, uniform software stack and environment down to the JupyterLab extensions that you're using, well, then it might make sense to go with a system-wide approach that is shared not just with yourself, but with all the other users on that system. And you might find that to be um, a better approach overall. Okay. So that's my talk. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that you that you learned uh, learned something that will be useful the next time you start a new data science project with Jupyter Lab. I put a link here uh, to the repo for my talk. It has all the branches that contain the various um, um, environments for the system wide and the project specific environments that I talked about, um, as well as instructions for how to install those environments locally if you want, or how to launch them on Binder if you want. Um, I'm also available uh, and active on social media, particularly on Twitter and GitHub. I'm also available on LinkedIn. Um, really excited to get feedback um, on both this talk. It's my first talk uh, at uh, JupyterCon or on the JupyterLab ecosystem, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Look forward to hearing feedback.